open up your Bible to Psalm 103, and we're going to jump off in Psalm 103 tonight. Hallelujah. Psalm 103. We're just going to look at the first few verses. I just want to start this night out by talking about this. The 103rd Psalm. Hallelujah. You know, I got to tell you, we are Faith Family Church. Right, we, we see in Scripture that the local church is the foundation of the educational program, of the foundation of everything that Jesus is doing in the church. Now, are there other parachurch ministries outside the walls of the church? Absolutely. But they all have their roots in a local church. So show me a minister who's out there doing his own thing that, that, that's not connected to a pastor in a local church I won't, I'll show you a ministry that's not really doing anything. I know some great ministers in the world, and they all have pastors. Now, they might hardly ever do anything in their local church just because, other than give just because they're traveling all over the place or they're doing things. But they're submitted to what God, the, where God has them. Um, submission, I, I've never taught a series on this. Submission to authority is so important. Well, I wasn't even planning on saying this. It's so important because God does everything by delegated authority. So every one of us will be submitted to an authority in our life, our whole life. And, and we get in the trouble when we stop submitting to the authority in our, lo- in our life. Uh, we get into trouble when we stop honoring that authority. Right? I remember when I was a national sales manager. Uh, the CEO of the company wanted to do something, and I'm like... I'm in charge of sales, and I'm like, oh my gosh, if we do that, this will blow up everything. And uh, so I, I told, I, I, I pled my case with the CEO of the company. He goes, well, let me think about it. Pulled me back in his office a couple days later. He goes, yep, thought about what you said. I could see where you're coming from, but no, I want to do it. So I had to call all 63 salesmen of mine nationwide, and I told them, you know what? Uh, we're going to do this. People are freaking out. Not once did I ever say, well, you know, my boss told me we have to. No, no, no. I'm I'm submitted to his authority. Same way with Jesus. We're going to talk tonight about yielding. Yielding to God. If you're not submitted to the authority in your life, you won't be able to be submitted to the Lord. The church is running rampant with sickness and disease And the enemy is stealing, killing, and destroying within our church because people, they they refuse to respect the authority. So we're, you know, this is a year where God wants you to break out of self-centeredness and some things. Listen, here's the thing. If you're not submitted to him, if you don't know how to yield to him, you won't see areas of your life that are keeping you out right? And you'll live your life. We, we are, if you look at the body of Christ right now, it looks, the church in America looks a lot like the world. Can a child of God not know God? Absolutely. Right? Yes, you can be saved and know him as your savior, which means to you, I'll go to heaven when I die. But God wants you to come to the knowledge of the truth to find out who you are in Christ so that out of that amazing revelation that he loves you and how he came looking for you where you were a rotting corpse, dead spiritually, and he sent his son to die for you then. What happens now is now when I see who I am in him, that's what straightens out my behavior. Does God love me when my behavior is not good? Yeah, exactly the same. His love for you never changes. But I'm telling you, God, it doesn't please him because it never pleases your father when the enemy has access into your life. He doesn't want the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy anything in your life. And that's why what's really cool is you can make a decision because of who you are in Christ, because of the reality that he died for all of your sins. Your sins, everyone you've ever committed, everyone you committed today, everyone you'll ever commit, all of it was judged once and for all in the body of Jesus, and, and it will never, your sin will never be judged again. 
Isn't that good news? Man, so when I stand before God, the only thing that's going to be judged, not me, my works. That's it. The sin, I won't be judged for sin. Why? Because it's already been condemned in the body of Jesus. When I realize that the Bible says it doesn't give me a license to sin, it empowers me to walk holy. But it's all about yielding to God. Look at the benefits of the Lord. Psalm 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, look at this. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. And then he lists in verse 3 two benefits. The two greatest benefits. He forgiveth all of your iniquities. And he healeth, how many? All of your diseases. Wow. As a matter of fact, if you study Isaiah 53, you come to find out, and a myriad of other scriptures, in the same way that he died and paid the price so that all of your iniquities are forgiven, in the exact same way, all of your sicknesses and diseases were put on him so now you don't have to bear them. In the same way that you've been forgiven, you've been healed. Right? It's exactly the same. You cannot separate it to be honest with you in the same way that you've been forgiven and made spiritually alive in the same way you've been healed from all sickness and disease in the same way you've had poverty and lack removed for your life he was made poor for you where on the cross so that you and i through his poverty might be made rich that that word rich in the greek language it literally means a full and abundant supply You're never to have just enough in this earth. You're to have more than enough always. If you don't have more than enough now, realize you have more than enough. Start meditating in the word. Get some faith going, right? Because faith comes by hearing his word. Start speaking the word of God and watch how heaven will line up with all of it. Jesus will watch over his word and will bring that provision into your life. This is the way it works. So now tonight, though, I want to talk to... See, there's in the realm of healing, but it's really in every realm. We don't yield to God because we want to walk in the blessings of God our way. Right? We have a great story. We're going to hopefully, if we have time, we'll look at an Old Testament and a New Testament story But go to 2 Kings chapter 5, and I want to read to you the story of Naaman. Naaman. 2 Kings chapter 5, we'll start right in verse 1. Guys doing okay? We started out a little bit different, but this is going to be really good. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. It says here, Now Naaman captain of the host of the king of Syria. Now, this word captain would mean that he was a general. He was actually a very highly decorated officer, probably the highest decorated officer in all of Syria. He was captain of the host of the king of Syria. He was a great man with his master. His master was the king. And honorable because by him... The Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. So he had leprosy. That that disease was a death sentence. Just a death sentence on him. Verse 2, And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, And she waited on Naaman's wife. See, when they would conquer, they'd bring back people. And apparently this this young girl who was from Israel became Naaman's wife's, just she took care of stuff in their house, right? And so now she's a maid. And look at what it says in verse 3. And she said unto her mistress, so she said unto Naaman's wife, the little maid said unto Naaman's wife, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him 
from his le- or of his leprosy. So this little maid's like, man, you know, I wish Naaman could go to the prophet that's in Samaria because this prophet of God would recover him from his leprosy. Okay? So keep, keep that story in your mind. Verse 4, And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is, in the land, that is of the land of Israel. So now, get this, who's this one? And one went in and told his Lord. Now, this is not talking about going in and telling Naaman. They went in and told his Lord, the king. So obviously, there was talk somehow in Naaman's house, and somehow a servant directly associated with the king of Syria heard something about what this maid said, and then went to the king of Syria and told him this. So when one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. Now look at what happened after that. Verse 5, And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. Now, if you were to put that in today's dollars, it would, depending, you know, gold and silver is always changing, it would be around 300, minimum $300,000 worth of stuff. So the king then tells Naaman, I want you to go to the king of Israel and he's going to heal you. Now, is that what the servant said? Nope. Said, oh, I would that my master would be able to go to the prophet so that the prophet would recover him. But notice, you have the king of Syria. I'm a king. I only deal with kings. I serve the god of ramen, right? That's where we get ramen noodles. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> but, you know, had about as much power, right? Um, no, uh, he probably could care less about some prophet in Israel. So Naaman... So here's Naaman. I mean, this, you got to follow this story. So now here's Naaman. The king sends him. So he's like, okay, I want you to go. Now look at, but look at this letter though. And he brought a letter to the king of Israel saying, now when this letter is come unto you. So this is the letter that the king of Syria has sent to the king of Israel. Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I've therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee. And look at what he says, that you may recover him of his leprosy. So could you imagine being the king of Israel? He just, and, and, and notice how the king of Syria is not asking permission. It doesn't say, hey, can I send Naaman to you so that you could recover him? No, he's saying, hey, um, I'm sending you this letter. Naaman's already on his way. He's coming to you, and and I want you to heal him of his leprosy. Right? So now look at what happens. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes. Now, renting of clothes, when a king rent his clothes, if he rent it, it was a way of a surrender to God. Right? But he wasn't renting his clothes this way this time. He was renting his clothes because of his fear of the king of Syria. Which literally, in that culture, him renting his clothes was an outward sign that I'm surrendering. I'm freaked out. This king of Syria, I'm I'm surrendering to him because, oh my gosh, am I in trouble. Right? And he rent his clothes and said, am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man does send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeks a quarrel against me. No, this king, the king of Israel is stressed. He's afraid. He's like, this king of Syria, he wants to come and conquer our land, so he's just using this. This is a trick. And it was so, verse 8, when Elisha, 
the man of God heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king saying, wherefore or why have you rent your clothes? Now, if you look at the Hebrew language, basically, Elijah was t- Elisha was ticked. He's like, what is your problem? Why are you renting? Why are you surrendering to this idiot? Send, send the king to me or send Naaman to me, right? And he'll know that there's a prophet in Israel. So it was, that's kind of the attitude about Elisha. He's not messing around. He's like, listen, we're Israel. We're God's chosen people. He's our God. And nobody can mess with us. King, why are you surrendering to this guy? Right? So that's kind of just to get you to know the gist of this. Send him to me. Let him now come unto me. Verse 8. And he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came. Could you imagine the most decorated general in the Syrian army who's, who's just destroyed all kinds. They've taken captive from people from all these countries. So he comes in his chariot. That he, a chariot like that would have splendor about it. And all of his horses and who knows how many soldiers and all the stuff like this grand... I mean, could you imagine all of a sudden... Here's a, here's a king of a nation pulling up to your house with everything, right? And here's what happens. Elisha, Elisha sends his servant. Hey, the, the dude's here. Um, can you, when you stop washing that dish, can you, can you go out, tell the guy he's got to dip in the Jordan River seven times and he'll be clean. The end. So here's a dignitary who everywhere he goes, there's an entourage to welcome him. Oh, Naaman, come on. What can we do for you? Can we water your horses? Can we do this? What can, what can we give you? Not the prophet of God. He sends his servant out. Go tell the guy to... And, and by the way, the, Jer- the Jordan River is only like the dirtiest river. It, it's like the dirtiest river. Right? So this is what's happening. Naaman is expecting to be received a certain way, and he's not. Why? Now, well, let's, let me read, and then we'll go into this as the Lord leads me. It says, and Elijah sent, verse 10. Well, let me start in verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. So, I mean, he's at the door. Couldn't even the servant open the door and Elisha talk to him through the door? No, we're not doing that even. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, Go, wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and you'll be clean. Verse 11. That whole thing did not go down the way Naaman really thought it would. Right? So look at what it says. But Naaman was wroth. Naaman was not a financial investment. He was not a Roth IRA, right? Spelled a little different. No, he was, this word Roth means he was very, very angry. He was Roth and went away. So he immediately is just ticked and went away and said, Behold, now get this, I thought... These three words are keeping Christians from being healed, from walking in the blessing of God all over the place. Behold, I thought. Because of his thinking, the reason why he got mad is because he had certain of mine's conclusions about who he was, about who God was, and about his circumstances. And, 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 you know, I, I'm, I'm a general. Everywhere I go, people say, what can I do for you? And they're, they're saluting. And here, this guy tells me to go dip. D- won't even come out here. And he tells me to go dip in a mud puddle seven times. No explanation, no anything. See, he was mad at that. His mind's conclusions 
is what caused him to not yield. This is why you have to take every thought captive. Because you don't want to gain and get mind conclusions about who God is. Some people's conclusions about God is he heals some and not others. Some people's conclusions about their circumstance is there's no hope. Right? Some, pe some people's uh, thought processes and conclusions about them, this is usually what it is, is that I don't deserve it. Right? Can we just put that one to bed right now? You and I don't deserve it. Done. Oh, we got to forget the second part of that. And that has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with what Jesus did. You're going to learn it. This is, this is not about you. You have sickness in your body tonight? It's not about you. Your body belongs to him. It's all about Jesus, and he provided healing despite anything you have done or have not done. And he's just saying, come to the table. It's yours. Right? But see, there's something about this story that you're going to see. Naaman received nothing until he yielded. So many Christians, they're wondering why. And they get mad at God. And they're wondering, why did God allow this in my life? And they don't realize that God has to allow what you and I allow. Because he can't violate our will because he gave us a will. But oh, he'll keep coming and keep wooing you so that you live in his best. So let's keep going with this story. So Naaman was wroth, verse 11, went his way and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. He had it all played out in his mind, exactly how it was going to happen. The problem with that is that's not, that, that's contrary to what the word says. The word was what? See, Elisha was a prophet. So a prophet would only say what God said. So what was the word of God? Go dip in the mud puddle seven times and you'll be clean. Right? I mean, you're a leper, dude. Who cares? You're talking about clean, no more leprosy. Do you see how even in desperate situations, if people are looking at themselves wrong, if they have a wrong perception of their circumstances and their situations, in the middle, in the middle of you could die, you're going to get mad about the way God wants to heal you? We're going to see that yielding to God is simply yielding to his word. I think the reason why I said that about yielding to others is, see, if I don't yield to my wife, I, it's revealing that I'm not yielding to him. See, everything's reflective in your life. If you don't love me, you can't say that you love God. Right? Because it's impossible to say that. Because God, God even said that. If you don't love who you can see, how can you say you love me who you haven't seen? It's all reflective. If you're not submitted to the authority in your life, you, it, it reveals that you're not submitted to God. If you're not, if you're not submitted to that boss of yours at work that may not even be a Christian, and, and not only not a Christian, may not even be fair, may not even be nice, but if you're not submitted to him, it's only one reason, because you're not submitted to God. Ooh. Pastor, wow, I forgot my steel-toed shoes. Yeah, me too. My toes are a little painful right now, but the healer's in the house, so it's all good, right? Now, now, you know, I have to make a disclaimer because of what people have sat under with pastors. You know what? I'm the spiritual authority in your life as a pastor, but this is how an under-shepherd pastor walks that out. I'm to love you with the love of God as your friend. And I walk out my spiritual authority in your life by serving you. Not by telling you what to do. I'm not anointed to tell you what to do. The word tells us what to do. I'm anointed to love you, 
to, 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 to preach the word of God, which will build you up and equip you to go walk and, and run your race. But not to tell you what to do, not to beat you down and, you know, all this other stuff. Listen, if I come to you, if I come to Tammy and go, hey, you know, thus saith the Lord, you should do this. If that doesn't bear witness with her heart, she's a New Testament believer. Hebrews tells us God who at sundry times and in various, various ways spoke in times past unto the prophets in these last days has spoken to us by his son. If it doesn't confirm with Tammy something that's already in her heart, thank you, pastor, I know you love me. Everybody could miss it. I'm throwing it away. And, and my response should be awesome because that's exactly what you're supposed to do. Does that make sense? If you're in a situation where the authority in your life, you cannot, it violates your heart to do what they want you to do, this is what you do as a child of God. You remove yourself from the authority. But you remove yourself in a way that does not cause any division or harm to the organization, the company, or anything. And when people, remember, you're a New Testament believer. So if anybody asks you why you're leaving the company, you say, you, you got to tell them the real reason. Because the Spirit of God's leading me to. Yeah, but why? Did somebody do something to you? Oh, no, I'm leaving because the Spirit of God led me to. If you can't say that, then you got to get your priorities straight. See, so let's say you don't like your job. Well, go to the Lord and ask him if you could have a transfer. But if he says no, then it's no. Yes, sir. And you walk away going, okay, this is cool, because God's going to move. Because he's so good. If he's not removing me, he might remove the authority. I don't know. But I'm not, I don't have to do anything, but I'll love the guy. Do you know in your life you have no competition? There is no competition. God's already given you the victory. You could take the person who would, the world would say is your competition and bless them. Amen. And, and he still can't. That, that person still won't get that promotion if you're supposed to have it. As a matter of fact, if you really want to move up in a company, start praying that other people move up. And see what God does there. See, we have to know who we are. So let me get back to this. Verse 11 he tells them how he thought it should happen. Verse 12, and then he says this. So he goes, the guy wouldn't even come out. I thought he would come out, strike his hand over me, and, the, and his God would just heal me. But then he says in verse 12, are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus? Damascus is in Syria. So now Naaman's going, why did I have to come all the way here? Why couldn't, there's two really good rivers, and if you study history, those two rivers were much cleaner than the Jordan River. Why did I have to come all the way here? Right? Again, God, I don't want to do it your way, I want to do it my way. And it says here, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went his way in rage. So basically you have the general the most powerful general in the army of Syria acting like a little baby. Wow. He went his way and changed his diaper, right? So, verse 13, And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some, do some great thing, in the Hebrew language just means something important that would match who you are. Right? If he would have told you to do that, you, wouldn't you have done it? See, they, knew, they, were, they were coming to him. They, they cared for him. And they know this guy, you, you don't tell him you can't do something. So they're like going, hey, if he would have told you to do something that is great, like you're great, you would have done it. So when they said that, how much rather than when he said to thee, wash and be clean, then went he down. So now Naaman decided because of that, he goes down and dips himself seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child and he was clean. That would almost be scary if I felt my own skin and it was that soft. But you know, but isn't that amazing? 
He just listened. Notice when he yielded, that's when he received. Notice he didn't receive until he yielded. If he had never yielded, he would have never received. Why is this written here? This is written, this is written for us. It's a pattern. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. He's saying, hey, all this stuff that I brought you, will you please take it? Right? I know there's no other God. Verse 16, but he said, now this is now Elisha saying, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Elisha says, I'm not taking anything from you. Right? Why is that? You need to know that whatever anointings you have upon your life, you need to know freely you've received, you freely give. Right? I remember when we were in a school and there was a man who was very wealthy and, and he came to our church service one day and, and I was given all these examples and afterwards he comes up to me and he's like, why did you talk about all these things? And I just, you know, I just said passing, well, you know, I just, I just minister out of what the Lord has me say and and he, and he looks at me and he goes, you literally spoke everything in my, that's in my life right now. And he wanted to get together with me. You know, he's going through a lot of stuff. So we got together and he's like, listen, how can I help you? What can I, he's a businessman. Everybody, he's a multimillionaire. Everybody, everybody's always trying to get something from him. And the Lord told me that day at church, don't you take anything from him. Yes, sir. Right? Remember, we're children of God. We don't live in lack. We don't, we don't need people. We have him. So, so and, I, you know, and, and I was able to minister to him. I'm like, listen, I said, I, 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 I don't want to take anything from you. Well, I could help you. I, I, I own a lot of real estate and this and that and all this stuff. And I'm like, no, no, no. You know, we, we don't want you to give us anything. And so this is what, this, this is what was happening here. Why would God have Elisha do that? For Naaman. Because he wants Naaman to know, hey, you don't, this is not stuff you can buy. Right? This God who just healed you did it because he loves you. So we have to learn something from this, don't we? What do we learn as Christians? Oh God, if you'll just heal my body, I'll serve you all the days of my life. And, and oh, you know, I promise I'll read my Bible. I will even, I promise I'll never kick my dog again. And I, you know, all this stuff, right? And, and we're trying to give God something so he'll give us something. It doesn't work that way because he's already given you everything. Got to know that. So he says this, and Naaman, verse 17 said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. Now theologians with this, where it says two mules burnt the earth, a lot of people believe that what Naaman was saying to Elijah, he's saying, can you just... Give me this piece of earth here so I could build an altar and, and do an offering to, to your God. That makes no sense to me because in the culture, Naaman would have known if you want some land, you don't ask a prophet, you have to ask the king. And, and Naaman knows a, a military guy, he, it doesn't make sense for him to offer a burnt offering. If you, if you study out the philosophy of that day was silver and gold and all the things of the earth. All these things, they came from the earth. So I think what he was saying is, please, can, can you just take these two mules that are loaded with stuff, you know, as an offering to God? That, that's all he was saying. So, uh, and then he, but then he said this, 
And I and I and I'm I'm committing myself today. I'll never offer burnt offerings to any other god. But then he says in verse 19, look at this. Well, let me say, let me in verse eight, in verse 18, he says this: In this thing, the Lord pardoned thy servant. So now, now Naaman's saying, I'm not gonna ever, I'm not gonna ever do offerings to another God. But I need you to go to God on my behalf. And here's the story. He said, because every time the king of Syria goes in to, to offer to the God of Ramen, he grabs me and I have to kneel down like he kneels down. And if I don't kneel down, he, he would have me killed instantly. So he's saying, could you go to God? I'm not going to offer burnt offerings to anybody other God, but could you go to him and just ask him? Because I'm going to have to bow in this temple, but it means nothing to me. Can you go to God and just see if he can make an exception? Look at, look at what it says. Let me read it to you. In this thing the Lord pardoned thy servant, that when my master goes into the house of Rim, uh, Rimmon, whatever, I was trying to make fun, to worship there, and he leaneth on the hand, all I'm seeing is a bowl of noodles, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardoned thy servant in this thing. Because basically Naaman's saying it doesn't mean anything to me. I just have to do this. Look at what it says in verse 19. This shocks Christians. And he said unto him, Elisha said unto him, go in peace. And he departed from him a little way. He said, go in peace. He says, Naaman, the God which I serve He's always looking at your heart, not at these natural actions. So it's okay. If you got a bow, don't worry about it. Do you see that? God's always, why is it there? Because God wants you to know he's looking at your heart. And if you get your heart in the right place, your actions will always follow in the right place. Right? So this was in this situation. Now, am I saying that these early believers who either said, you either proclaim Caesar is Lord or I'm going to burn you to a stake, well, they couldn't do that. You'll know as you follow the leading of the Lord what to do in every situation. So, so do you see in this story, there's some, some things. Naaman was mad because of what he was thinking. It gets all the way back to his thought life right? He's mad. He's mad because things are not working out the way he wants them to. This is not happening. How many times? God, why can't you just, what, you know, I went up there, they laid hands on me. Why can't you just make the thing disappear right now? Right? Doesn't happen maybe the way you think. Look at, go to Isaiah real quick. You guys doing okay? Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19. Let's look at verse 18 because it's so good. Isaiah 1, 18 says this. This is God talking. He says, come now and let us reason together. Reason. It literally means, come to me now so that I can correct you and convince you to start thinking right and doing the right thing. God doesn't want you to come to him and debate. Well, you know, I just don't believe. No, no, that's not what he's talking about. This word is very clear. It's the root. It means to be right, to correct, to convince. If you break it all down, it literally means to correct and convince so as to be right. God will always want to correct and convince you so that you can be right, always. Because you have to be right. Right? I thought for years that, well, not for years. I, I thought for months after I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was a few months. And I thought it was just me. The enemy's like, that's just you. That, that whole tongues thing, because I grew up in a denomination that believed it was of the devil. I go down and, and, you know, I go to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, he says, well, just, just speak out. And I, I, it, it felt like I was mumbling, right? And so I, I'm like, Lord, 
this is not tongues. This is me talking. And the enemy's like, yeah, that's you. That's not God. But have you ever read when the, when the, the day of Pentecost was fully come? They were sitting in the upper room. And it said the Spirit of God descended upon them, right? Like tongues of fire. And the Holy Ghost spoke. It doesn't say that. It says they spoke. Why? Because when you speak in tongues, you are speaking. The Holy Spirit gives you the utterance in your spirit, and then your mouth speaks it out. So it, you, you'll sit there and go, gosh, it sounds like me. Well, it is. But oh, just keep speaking because it's like a nuclear power plant going off on the inside of you and it'll make all kinds of changes in your life. And what might not sound like much of a language now will become, oh, it'll just, it'll just grow because the whole baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's not an event. It's, it's a one time where you're filled and then your whole life you're be being filled. So it's constantly growing in your life. So what, why am I saying that? You have to have knowledge right? So look at this. It says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Why is that there? Because right after that, it says, if you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Because all of the blessings of God are tied to your relationship with him. All of them. All of your authority in God is tied to your relationship with Him. Everything is about your relationship with Him. But I want you to see this. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. So what does it mean to yield to God? Right? To yield to God, you have to yield to His Word. You gain knowledge of the Word of God, and as you gain revelation knowledge of His Word, it changes your thinking and puts you in a position where you will yield to His Word. So you have to, you have to hear the Word of God. As you gain knowledge of God, it changes your thinking. Sounds a lot like this in Romans 12, right? Verse 2. Right? Can everybody quote that verse, Romans 12, 2? Don't be conformed to this world, but be how what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you gain knowledge of God, and what that does is it, it changes your thinking, and now it puts you in a position to where you'll yield to God and yield to his word. So important that we know that. So, but, but you have to have knowledge. Now let's go to Isaiah 5. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13, it, it, it comes out, it says something really profound. It says, therefore, my people are gone into captivity. It, that, that word captivity means to be exposed, right? To be exposed and taken into exile. Why, did, why were they exposed and taken into exile? It says here, because they have no knowledge. This word knowledge, it has to do with discernment. For a New Testament believer, when you read this Hebrew word, you know it's revelation knowledge that comes from the Holy Spirit. You're going to be exposed and taken into exile if you don't have revelation knowledge of God's word. It says it like this in the New Testament. The enemy, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. You don't want to be exposed as somebody who doesn't know. They're not walking in faith. You're not walking in love. The doors are wide open for the enemy. That's what this is talking about here. So now let's go back to Hosea, because it says it a little different. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. In the King James, it says this, "...my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge." And again, the word knowledge is da'at. It means discernment. But the word destroyed is the word damal. It literally means to be silenced and cut off and then destroyed. If you don't have revelation knowledge, you're going to be silenced. 
which means you will not be able to take thoughts captive. You won't be able to speak in faith because you're silent. You have nothing to say. But oh, if you have revelation knowledge that by his stripes I am healed, that Jesus himself bore my sickness and carried my pain, and I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and I talk the word because I'm, I'm, it's flowing out of the revelation knowledge, I will never be destroyed. Does that make sense? My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject you that thou shalt be no priest. And that goes into the story. But you're destroyed and taken captive by a lack of knowledge. So we gotta, you know, I wish I could... Boy, it's 8.15. Maybe we'll have to go into this next week. I really wanted to read the story about the nobleman's son. It's a perfect example. You could go, it's in the Gospel of John. And, and go in there and, and look at it. And if the Lord leads us, maybe we'll go into this a little bit more. Because the nobleman, he walks 15 to 20 miles. And he comes to Jesus and he's like, Jesus, please come to my house and heal my son. He, the nobleman has it in his mind that if Jesus will just come to his house, he'll heal his son. But that's not the way Jesus wanted to do it. I should back up and say, that's not the way God wanted to do it. Jesus had to get the man to yield because Jesus said, go your way, your son lives. Could you imagine that walk back to his house, 15 to 20 miles. The enemy sitting on his shoulder. Oh, your son's probably dead now. Right? He was tempted. But the son got better from that hour, which tells me that there's no way that this guy was going, man, I can't believe Jesus didn't come to my house. If, if he was saying, I can't believe Jesus wouldn't come to my house, that story wouldn't be in the Bible because the son would have died. The nobleman's son, he yielded. He, he really wanted it another way, but he yielded. So I want to encourage you. Healing is yours. All the blessings of God are yours. So ask the Holy Spirit to show you, what am I missing? What, what about my life? Now, I'll tell you this right now. The main thing, that if, you, if, you, if something's keeping you out from the blessing of God, you know what it is right now. There, there's something, and you probably think about it all the time. I know I'm doing this, and I shouldn't. But, but if, if you don't know, ask the Lord. And if you do know, then talk to him about it. You know, I know I need to change this. And I know, I know I can't do it in my own strength, so I, I need you to help me. Right? He'll meet you. It, the whole gospel account of Jesus' earthly ministry was him meeting people right where they were and then bringing them right where, they, where he wanted them. He would always help people receive from him. The Holy Spirit now, you're, you're not like, an old, like when Jesus was on the earth. That was like before he went to the cross. That's old covenant stuff. How much more? You're his child. You have, you're, you're a brand new spirit. You literally have the ability to receive from God. You're wired to walk by faith. And by the way, God in the person of the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you to teach you and guide you. So I, I want to encourage you, go to the Lord. Listen, if you're missing it in areas of your life, if you're not wanting to lay him down, whatever, he knows right where you are. You know, we talk about a Jezebel spirit. And when a person has a stronghold in their life like that, uh, it's a stronghold, so it's like they don't see it. So, so they can't break out and nobody could break in. But you know, they could be delivered of, and you could be delivered of anything as a child of God if you want it. So I want to encourage you, if there's something that's been in your life and you want to break out of it, come, go to the Lord and say, hey, what am I not seeing? Show me. Or if, there's, if, if you're like me and there's a whole bunch of stuff, you, you want to get the order right. He will tell you the first thing you need to work on. And here's the cool thing. If you have a whole list like I had, 
You work on something and then you're like, wow, that's cool. And then, then he reveals the next thing and then you work. And then what happens is all of a sudden you're free from this. But then the next four things you don't even have anymore. And you're like, what? Well, while you were giving him the one thing, he was working on the other stuff. As you minister, you know, we're, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit on Sundays. Brother Hagen would always say this. It, so he would have people come to him in meetings. And, and a lot of times early on, he would sit in a chair because he would want to teach the pastors how to lead people in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, how to minister to sick. So he'd sit in a chair and have people come up to him. And he'd ask them, so what do you need of the Lord? And sometimes, you know, the, the two classes of the, of the thing were, I, I want to be, I want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or if you want to be healed, come on up. So he'd ask, what did you come up for? Some people are like, I want both. Brother Hagen always said, minister to the spiritual needs of the people first. So he would, he would get them filled with the Holy Spirit. Many times, he goes, okay, what, so what's going on in your body? And they'd be like, uh, I'm healed. Many times when you take care of some of these spiritual things, it eradicates the physical. What do you guys think about that? Isn't that good news? God wants to help you. He wants to help you tonight. Amen?